If you have your Bibles, let's turn to the, uh, the Gospel of Matthew. We'll see if it's a sea or a lake. <clears throat> this is, uh, it's actually the last part of what we talked about for the last week or more. And, uh, and it kind of deals a little bit more in the practical side of Jesus walking on the water. And, uh, and the practical application of that. What does that look like? What does that mean in, in your life then as you move to walk on the water? Where does that take you to? And, uh, and so let's read that passage again. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. Matthew chapter 14 and verse 22. And uh, <clears throat> as we're reading it, pay attention. I know you do anyway. But, but, but what I mean by that, isn't that awful? That just didn't come out right. I mean, pay attention to the, to the finer details of the story because the story has become so familiar to us. We, we look for certain events and there's certain... You know, as the story builds in crescendo and then it drops down the other side, we look for like Jesus walking on the water, Peter getting on the boat, but look for the finer details as I, as I read it this morning and follow along. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. It says, <clears throat> immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, <clears throat> he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves, because the wind was against it. Now during the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake, so... <clears throat> When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Let's pray. <clears throat> our Father, today, Lord, we, Lord, we want to express again today our thankfulness. Lord, that we can be a part of the kingdom in these days. Our Father, we recognize, Lord, that for such a time as this, such a time as this politically, such a time as, as this socially, such a time as this economically, for such a time as this, Lord, you have called these people to be a part of your kingdom in these days. And Father, I'm asking, Lord, today in Jesus' name that you would guide and guard and direct our steps in all that we do and say. Father, you know the stuff of life that whirls around us. And Father, you know the things that, that almost sometimes seek to overwhelm us. <clears throat> but yet, Lord, the storms of life as they come and, and buffet our little ships. And Father, help us to, to have our eyes looking intently into the darkness that we can see you as you draw close <laughs> We can see you as you come walking on the water. We can see you through the, through the, through the, the mist and see you through the waves and, and see you, Lord, into the very deepest parts of, of where we travel according to your will. Father, you know our hearts today. 
Lord, you know the many things that whirl around in our minds and in our spirits. And, and Father, the many activities that we've been a part of. And, and Father, I'm asking, Lord, this morning for clarity and understanding and discernment in each one of our hearts and in each one of our spirits. Lord, for some, this has been a difficult week. Lord, there has been some news of trauma and trouble that have come into some lives. And, and Father, we ask this morning in Jesus' name that you would set your hand of peace and mercy and grace on their hearts and on their families. And Father, some mourn the loss of loved ones. And Father, we lift them up to you and we, we ask, Father, that you would bring peace not as the world brings, but, Father, peace that settles deep down into the very core of who they are. Grant comfort, you who are the comforter. And Father, this morning, Lord, you know that for some this has been a good week. Lord, great things have happened and doors have opened and, and, and windows of understanding are shining light in to life situations and decisions that need to be made. And, and Father, there's so many things that are good that are happening. And Father, I, I pray for them today also, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would, would overshadow them with a greater sense of your wisdom and a greater sense of your direction. And Father, I pray, Lord, here this morning for many of us who are somewhere just in the middle. And, and Father, maybe not the worst, although we've seen the shadows, maybe not the the brightest of weeks, Lord, although we felt the warmth of your presence. But, Father, wherever we find ourselves today, Lord, might your presence, might your Holy Spirit, might your spirit of truth bring your truth into our life situations wherever we are and whatever condition we find ourselves in today. Father, I pray for the needs that are represented here. I pray, Lord, for the needs that are represented for those who are listening at home. Lord, for those who will listen this week and this month, uh, Father, through YouTube, I pray, Lord, for, for all those that this message and this prayer touches, uh, Father, whose ears they might rest upon, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would, would move into their hearts and lives in Jesus' name. <clears throat> but Father, here now this morning, as we look into your word, Holy Spirit, again, I pray that you would speak your truth as Jesus said you would. We claim that, we receive that into our lives, that you have come to speak into our lives your truth of those words, of those situations, of those events, Lord, that we need within us. Father, guard and guide the words of this mouth. Father, don't let there be anything crazy or foolish come across these lips. But Father, we desire to know, thus saith the Lord. Father, I recognize your sovereignty and I submit myself to you who are the king of all things. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> you notice as we read through this, I mean, we, we've talked about this for a couple of weeks now anyway. And uh, Jesus compelled the disciples, didn't he? He said immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat. There's, a, there's an interesting thought. That's a, that's a good thought right there. Immediately, Jesus made them get into the boat. Immediately after an event happened, Jesus gathered his disciples all together and he said, you know, there, there was a lot of people, you know, let's, let's, uh, let's maybe go back. It's, you know, there's, there's a couple of things here. First of all, there's the immediately of Jesus making them get into the boat. I guess we need to do, deal with that first. Immediately Jesus uh, made them get into the boat. Then down verse 27, it says... But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. There's this idea that as this, as this situation is unfolding, Jesus was immediately doing things. He immediately said to them, when fear was the strong emotion, he, he immediately said to them, you know, uh, don't be afraid, I'm here. 
But you notice that he didn't immediately get into the boat. Did you notice that? There's a, there's a lapse in how he acted immediately. Now that, that speaks about something there. Now, <clears throat> the other thing that kind of stood out to me is, as we were reading this, he said, it is I, don't be afraid. And Peter says, uh, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. And he said, you know, come on. And so Peter got out there, and then, then verse 30, 31, look at that. There's another one. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand, and, uh, and, he, and he picked him up, and he said, you know, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? And uh, when the wind died down, they climbed into the boat, and those that were there worshipped him. It's an interesting passage of scripture that we have here in, in front of us. Um, I think in one of the other ones, as they were going along, notice over in, uh, in the Gospel of John, chapter 7, we have the, the exact same passage of scripture, exact same story. Um, and there Jesus says he is... Uh, is all of this is, is happening. Uh, there's a passage down towards, uh, towards the end of uh, chapter 6. And down there it says, uh, he, he says here, I, I want to I read it for you. And, and many of the disciples are leaving Jesus at this point in time. So as uh, he says, aware of this, his disciples were grumbling about this. Jesus said to them, does this offend you? He was talking about his body, the bread and all that. And, and what if you see the Son of Man ascends where he was before? You know, the Spirit gives life. And he, and he talks about that and he goes on down through. And as he comes down to verse 67, he says there, he says, do you not want to leave me too? Jesus asked the twelve. And Simon Peter answered him and, and he said, uh, he said, Lord, to whom shall we go? For you have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus replied, he said, have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is the devil. And he, he meant Judas, <clears throat> the son of Simon Iscariot, who through one of the twelve was later, who though one of the twelve was later to betray him. Jesus, as he's, as he's talking about this, this is two different uh, <clears throat> situations that are happening here. But Jesus, as he's talking about this, <clears throat> on the one side, uh, after the, the situation of feeding the 5,000, he immediately asked them to get into the boat. And they go through a really difficult and a dark and a stormy time. Jesus comes walking on the water, and there's, a, there's, a, there's an idea that, that he's there immediately compelling them. He's immediately there once fear shows up, and, uh, and he's immediately there when, when Peter <clears throat> it begins to, uh, to sink. To grab him out of out of the water. Now, over here in uh, in the Gospel of John, we find another situation where they're going through a really difficult time, and a storm is is literally spiritually welling up around them because the disciples, a lot of them, are leaving Jesus. They don't understand again what's going on. There's a there's a sense of darkness. There's a sense of confusion. There's a sense of the little ship that they're in as they're moving through the course of human history. There's this sense that this little ship, you know, people are, are bailing. They're just, they're just jumping out all over the place because they don't understand what Jesus is talking about. And so Jesus says to them, he says, are you guys going to leave me now as well? One of them says, which one was it says that? Peter said, to him, he said, Lord, where will we go? <clears throat> now, the, the, the idea here, how this ties into the other one was when when Peter saw Jesus walking on the water, he said to him, if that's really you, ask me to come to you, or in effect, ask me to go out of the boat and to go to you. Now his response here was, was, you know, Lord, where will we go? Lord, you're out in the storm, you know, and you're walking on the water, you're doing all this. Where will we go if we were to leave you? And it, it's a good question to ask when you're in the middle of a storm, where will I go if I'm not here in the boat? Where will I go when life doesn't make sense? Where will I go that, that when the storm is happening around me, where am I going to go? Except to Jesus. Interesting thought, that. <clears throat> I wonder if we were to turn over to Mark chapter 4. What would we find there? 
Mark chapter 4, let's see here. Where's Mark at any? Matthew, Luke, Mark before and somewhere in there? Mark chapter 6, did I say Mark chapter 4? Well, it's a good thing you're paying attention there. Mark chapter 6, let's see here down, Mark chapter 6. Oh, look, there's another one about Jesus walking on the water. Hmm. Take courage, he said, down about verse, uh, last part of verse 50. The storm welling up around them. There in the boat, the wind's blowing. Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed. For they had not understood about the loaves. Did you see that? That must mean cast your bread upon the water and it will return back to you. Loaves, bread, water, storm, in a boat. Immediately get in the boat. Norma, am I making sense to you over here? Uh, you're not catching me at all, are you? <clears throat> so, okay, let me... Immediately he spoke to them. Mark chapter 6, right? That's where we're at. About verse 50. Okay, so verse 50 starts. It says, because they all saw him and were terrified... Immediately he spoke to them and said, take courage. It's I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. And they were completely amazed because the wind died down. That's not what it said. Well, they were completely amazed because he was walking on the water. Well, it doesn't say that either. They were completely amazed, it says, because or for they had not understood about the loaves. Well, how does that make any sense? You know what I'm saying, Marty? I don't get it. You know, they were completely amazed because of the loaves. Well, what does the loaves have to be, do with being in the boat? What does the loaves have to do with Jesus walking on the water? What does the loaves have to do with Jesus saying to his disciples, are you guys going to leave me too when things get too rough? What does the loaves have to do with Jesus? You know, he's saying the really hard things. And as you grow in your Christian journey, and it gets more and more difficult maybe to understand exactly what he's saying, are, are you going to leave Jesus at that time? What does the loaves have to do with that? Did you ever ask yourself that question? Well, I got an answer for you. <clears throat> Let's look at the loaves. What do we got? Let's look at the loaves. So in Mark chapter 6, Verse 30, it starts there. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to put the food in their mouth. They didn't even have a chance to eat. There's so many people coming and going all the time. He said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place because you need to get some rest. So they went away by themselves into a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said. And it is already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages to buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take eight months wages, eight months of a man's wages. Huh, they weren't politically correct, were they? That would take eight months of a man's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said, five, two fish. <clears throat> Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of fifties and hundreds, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves and he gave them to the, his disciples that sat before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. 
And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten were 5,000. Okay, so it says in verse 52, for they had not understood about the loaves. So in other words, <clears throat> all the situations that were happening on the boat were happening because they did not understand about the loaves. So if you, if you, if you begin then to put the two together, you, you, you're, you, you find a really interesting picture. And the interesting picture is, is this. It, the interesting picture is, uh, is that Jesus, you know, he, they begin it in the introduction and they... And they, Jesus pulls the disciples away because they need a bit of a rest to a solitary place. <clears throat> All of the people followed him there. And then verse 34, it starts, when Jesus landed and saw the large crowd, he had compassion on them. Now we understand well, compassion is a good thing. So he had compassion on them, but then he gives the reason why. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Now, I don't know anything about sheep. <clears throat> Maybe you do. <clears throat> Marty, you know anything about sheep? No. Anthony, you know anything about sheep? Not a, Not a thing. Wayne, you know anything about sheep? So I can say anything about sheep that I want because nobody here knows anything. You know something, Verna? Yeah? They're obstinate. They're obstinate, okay. And they all just, they just, <clears throat> now, Barb, only you would know that. <laughs> you're, you're right, because my son had them, and one took off over the bridge where we were in Pugwash, and it was down the Gulf Shore where he found it. Well, there. Good place for him to be. But Jesus says here, or the Bible says that Jesus had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. In other words, Jesus, when he saw the people, he saw that they were like, they were like wandering aimlessly. They had no direction. They had no purpose. They didn't know where they were going. They didn't know where was safety and where was, where was not safety. They didn't know where was food and where was not food. They were just, they were living lives without any direction or anyone to guide them or protect them or to look after them. They were just aimlessly wandering like sheep. And as Jesus saw this, it struck something in his heart that he had compassion on them. <clears throat> you know, I, uh, I, I think to myself a lot these days that the world is just, it just it's like sheep without a shepherd, wandering. You know, we say, well, you know, uh, um, people say, you know, well, you know, what gives you the right to say that you believe in God? That offends me for you to talk about it, you know, and there's all this kind of stuff that goes on and on and on. And, and yet you find such pain and such agony. And, and I mean, I, I could tell you stories of, of uh, situations that, that just even this week have come up. And, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm thinking... The, I don't know how people can handle so much agony constantly, you know, and, and yet they, they don't want to accept the way of Jesus Christ because they, it cramps my style and it does, you know, it's all this, all this stuff that goes on and, I'm, and, I, and I can't help sometimes, I, you know, I lose my filter and they're telling me this awful story about how life is and then, then they say, but you know, you're Jesus. I don't want anything to do with your Jesus. And so I, I, it comes out before I can stop and I say, well, how's life working for you? <laughs> Terrible. Terrible, right? It is. Like sheep without a shepherd all around us. And this is the situation that Jesus finds himself in. And it says that he, you know, if you were reading it in Greek, it says he's overcome with compassion because he saw deep in their hearts that that the stuff that they thought mattered in life didn't matter. The things they thought that, you know, that, that would set them free is not setting them free. And all the stuff of, that's going on in, all in life and in, in so many situations, it's just, it's destroying them. The suicide rate is 40 some percent. How's that working out for you? <clears throat> Notice what it says there. Verse 34, last line. So he began to teach them. Isn't that interesting? He saw with compassion all of these people, and so he began to teach them. So what do you suppose he began to teach them? Do you want to know what the meaning of life is? Do you, do you want to know how to be happy in life? Do, do, you want, do you want to know why you have such an ache in your heart? 
Do you, you want to know why your life hurts so much? I, I can tell you these things. He began to teach them. And he began to tell them stories <clears throat> that they could associate with. And, and he began to talk to them about, you know, you're, you're feeling so empty inside because you need a relationship with the Father. You need a relationship with the Creator. I can introduce you. I can tell you. There's, there's so much I want to give you. And he began to teach them all of this. Then it was late. Verse 35. <clears throat> and so after so much emotion and so much teaching and so much, so much just wanting to tell the people, you just want, I just want to open your eyes. I just want you to see what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I have so much I just want to give you. After a day of this, he says, he says, disciples, come here for a minute. You guys who have been following me, uh, Karen, come on up here, and Ken, and, and Brad, you know, you guys gather around, you know, and, and, and what, what are we going to do? Well, it's late. Before it gets too late, we need to make some preparations here, and, and you need to send these people someplace where they can buy some food. And then Jesus says to you, uh, where's it going here now? Verse uh, 36, he says, send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside. And villages and buy themselves something to eat. <clears throat> but he answered and he said, No, no, wait, no, no, hold, hold on a minute. Brad, you feed them. Well? Sure. Okay. Now that's not what they said, so you're ruining my story. <clears throat> but he said, he said, you feed them. So you can picture they look at each other. You know, what, what? Who's he talking to? Hayden, is he talking to you? He's talking to you. You're the guy who's wealthy. You know, we know that. Anybody with horses is wealthy. You know? Okay, maybe anybody with horses isn't wealthy because... No, never mind. So, you give them something to eat. And their response to him... Well, look, look at their response. This is, this, is, this is really curious. Their response to him, they said that would take... Eight months of a man's wages for one dinner. Now, eight months of a person's wages. So, so that would be uh, eight months if you were talking, I don't know, if you were talking 2,000 a month for eight, be 16,000, 3,000 for a month for eight, be 24,000, 4,000 for a month. If you know, you know, if you have horses, ten thousand for a month. You know, <laughs> but you know, like you're talking that you're talking twenty or thirty thousand dollars in our dollars today for one meal to feed five thousand people. Twenty or thirty thousand dollars. And God says to you, John, you feed them. Not my <laughs> Okay, so that's what they said. Okay, you're playing into my story. You you talk to Brad over here, will you? All right, because that's what he said. They said. They said, twenty or thirty thousand dollars. Where would we get that kind of money? I don't know where we get that kind of money. I don't have that kind of money, Scott. You got that kind of money, but I don't got that kind of money. Twenty or thirty thousand dollars. It would take eight months of a man's wages. You know, are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them? Now, now the the, the addition that they added to that was, you know, it's going to take twenty or thirty thousand dollars, and then they're asking him. They're asking him. Is this a good use of the resources we have? Like that's what they're asking. Because it says there, it says, are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? So they're asking him, they say, okay, we do have some resources. We've got Judas over here and he's got the money bag. Now, is that a good use of our resources? Should we take that, those shekels and those little coins that we have and spend it all? One meal for tonight. Is that what we should do? Hmm, what did he say? Didn't answer the question. Changed their minds. They talked dollars and cents. He talked, what do you got for bread? What do you got for food? In other words, he's saying here, dollars and cents don't feed the hungry. Bread feeds the hungry. Now we say, well, yeah, you can translate the dollars and cents buys bread. See, that's... Their way of thinking. Now, this is where it gets a little tricky because that was their way of thinking because that's our way of thinking. Dollars and cents buy bread, right? Todd, you're a 
mathematician and a financial genius, right? Dollars and cents, buy bread. And he said, no, I want you to bring the bread to me. Leave the dollars and cents where they're at. Bring the bread. Now, why didn't he multiply the dollars and cents, right? That's not the question you would ask. They said, we, we need eight months wages. So why didn't, wouldn't he say, well, how much money do you have? Bring your dollars and cents and I'm going to multiply it for you right here. That would have been a good trick, Marty. Right? I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, you're, I'm, going to, I'm going to give you a bank account here. You put it in the bank and, uh, and maybe, you know, don't buy Nortel, but maybe we'll do some Bank of Nova Scotia shares. And, and it's going to constantly increase, right? That's not what he said. Bring me the bread. Bring me the food. Not, 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 the, not the minerals, not the diamonds, not the gold, not the silver. Bring me the food. Okay, so let's, let's look at what he did with the food then. Because so. this, this relates directly, for they had not understood about the loaves. The, the problem on the water relates to the loaves. The problem when, when life gets difficult and people start leaving the kingdom, as they did over in, in the Gospel of John, that's a storm. And Jesus says, are you guys going to leave me too? And you say, no, because we understand about the loaves. So what happened here? Can I read this? Ben, no. He said, uh, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. When they found out, they said, they said, <laughs> look at that. I, said, I didn't notice that. How many loaves do you have? He's asked. He's, and he said, go and see. In other words, they didn't know. They just knew that what they had was not going to be enough. But we don't know how much we got. But whatever it is, it's not enough. There's a, there's a statement of faith in that, you think? I don't know how much I got. I don't know what my resources are, but whatever they are, Lord, it's not enough for you to get a hold of. It's not enough to meet the needs of the world around me. Whatever my intellectual capacities are, it's not enough to be a good witness for you. Whatever, whatever the amount of faith that I have, it's not enough to do what you're asking me to do. I don't know how much I got, but it's not enough. Jesus said, go and check it. Check the account. Let's see what you got. Drag it out into the sunlight. Get that thing out from underneath your, your, your mattress. Open the closet door. Shake out the, shake out the pockets. Let's see what's in here. Let's see what you got. So they came back. Ha, told you so. Five loaves. Two small fish. Not large fish. Not medium sized fish. These were small fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. Because <laughs> he wasn't discouraged by what they didn't have. He said, okay. The lesson proceeds. Okay, I understand now. He said, okay, now let's... let's uh, I have been teaching... Listen to this. I have been teaching the people about life in the kingdom. It's like sheep without a shepherd. And you guys are a little bit farther advanced because you have been with me. I have called to you. I have invited you to be followers. I have invited you to be my students. I, I, I'm expecting that you're going to listen, that you're going to learn. Bring what you have to me. We're, we're, we're You've counted it. You've hoarded it. So much so you don't even know what you got. You had to go do the bean counting to see what you got. Bring what you have to me. And then it says, verse 41, and this is a good, this is a good use of words. Taking... <laughs> See that taking? Uh, taking. You're hesitant to give. You be careful. Because when God needs it, He's taking it. Let that thing sink in for a minute. Be careful what you're hoarding. Because when God needs it, He's taking it. You can't stop. 
taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Now, there, there's another really strange thing I thought to myself. I thought, <clears throat> why wouldn't he... Uh... Okay, so he had, he had 12 disciples, five loaves and two fish. Why wouldn't he have broke five loaves in the, in the ten pieces and maybe the fish into, you know, a few as well and then, and then give those broken pieces into the disciples' hands and said, now you guys break these up into a lot more into the things and, and we'll distribute it like that. But it says he took the bread, he gave the thanks, and he broke the loaves. You know what I've noticed when we break our loaves? We're not fair. We're not usually fair. Because there's always this lingering thought. You know, I, I don't have my tithe envelope, but you know how sometimes it is, you're writing out your tithe check or you're, you're putting the cash into the tithing envelope and you're thinking, now I know you guys don't have any of this problem, so this will be all for people who are at home, you know, but, you, but you're, you're thinking about, you're thinking about, you know what, oh, my soul. I know what my tithe is, my tithe is 10%. I know that's why it's called a tithe, that's what tithe means, 10%. And you're writing that out and you're thinking, that's a big chunk right there. That's a big chunk of my hoarded resources right there. That's a big chunk of my five loaves and two fishes right there. I don't know if I can write that out. Because if we break the loaves, sometimes we don't break it in a fair kind of way according to what he desires for him to continue the blessing in our lives. So, so he broke the loaves. <laughs> And then he gave the broken pieces to his disciples and set to set before the people. He gave the broken pieces to the disciples to set before the people. They didn't understand. See, then look over there, verse 52, just to remind us, they didn't understand about the loaves. The loaves of broken pieces. The hoarded resources of broken pieces. The, the sense of, of gold and silver and broken pieces. The stuff that, that were holding body and soul together. The broken pieces of, 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 of all that they held in value. You know, when you're starving, food is pretty important. The broken pieces of all of that, that Jesus gave them the broken pieces of their lives to give to people. Broken pieces of life. I want to have a victorious testimony. I don't want to have a broken peace testimony. I don't want to have a broken peace message. I don't want to have a broken peace word of hope and life and faith. I want everybody to know that God is victorious and God is victorious but he gives us the broken pieces of our lives to share with other people. They all ate and were satisfied. And immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. They were all ate and they were all satisfied. And immediately, he said to the disciples, Okay, now it's your turn. Now it's your turn. Get into the boat. No, no arguing. I'm going to dismiss 5,000 people by myself. Right? Now think of, think of this. I'm going to dismiss 5,000 people who follow me all around the lake when we came across the lake, but I'm going to dismiss them by myself. I don't need any help. You guys immediately get into the boat. Because I'm thinking to myself, you didn't understand the miracle of the loaves. So now you're going to live it. And we're going to see what happens on the water. That's, the, that's kind of the synopsis of that, isn't it? But you know what? Over in the, the book of Acts, chapter 9, there's an interesting story there about Cornelius. Or Cornelius. Chapter 10 is Cornelius. Chapter 9 is about Ananias. Right? Ananias. What do you know about Ananias? 
right? You know, Ruth, because I told you already, right? But, uh, what, do you, what do you know about Ananias? Anything? anything? What else? Okay, first one to welcome Paul. What were you going to say, Mike? The one who died for not giving. Oh, okay, that was Ananias and Sapphira. That's right. That's a different Ananias, but it's a, that's a good story there, too. And why was that, Mike? Why did they die? That's because they didn't give the whole amount that they said that they got for their land. That's right, because they didn't give what? They lied to him. They lied to him. That's right. That's a pretty severe lesson right there. You don't get a second chance after that. Okay, so this Ananias, uh, you know, this is the conversion of Paul's story in, in Acts chapter 9. This is, this is a really cool kind of thing because this Ananias, unlike the other Ananias, of course, the other, other Ananias might have only been mentioned once as well, actually twice, but this one is only ever mentioned once. And he's not a, he's not a, a monumental figure of faith. Well, he is in this story, but you never see him again. It's just, it's just curious. Now, okay, so you know about Saul's conversion, you know, and he's, he's on his way to, to arrest and to torture and, and to put to death anybody who was a follower of Jesus Christ. But then here in verse 10, so, so he's, he's already fallen off the horse and he can't see and he's heard Jesus say, say, Saul, Saul, why are you trying to persecute me? It's really hard for you to do this. And, and so he, it's a great conversion story. Great story. Great, great conversion story. But, but now, now he's in Damascus. And he's, lay, he's been on bed, in, the, in bed for three days, three nights, hasn't eaten, hasn't drinking. Doesn't, his whole life is turned upside down, and nobody wants to talk to him because they all think it's a trick. That as soon as a Christian comes in, they're going to they're gonna arrest him, you know, they're going to put him in prison, they're going to kill him, all that kind of stuff. And so, um, and so it says, that we pick it up here in verse 10. It says, uh, in Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he's praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias. Ha <laughs> same name as you, funny thing. He said, come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this guy and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. There's a blessing. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. <laughs> then Ananias went to the house and entered it and placing his hands on Saul, he said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. After taking some food, he regained his strength. This is a, this is a really cool passage of scripture because Ananias is in the boat in a storm. So Ananias is in Jesus' boat. And the storm that's coming, they heard this guy Saul was on his way to Damascus, right? On the road to Damascus, he met Jesus. It was the Damascus Road experience. So Ananias lived in Damascus. He, there was a storm welling up around him. <clears throat> and we say, well, you know, yeah, that's, that's true, but, you know, that's, that's whatever. But let's, let's, let's say, let's say, um, hmm. Your buddy Trudeau is on the way to Oxford. But he's about to pass a new law up by the sinkhole. Don't get too close, Mr. Trudeau. But he's about to pass a new law up by the sinkhole that says, you know, that Christianity is now illegal. What would you be thinking? Now that's not out of the realm of possibility, right? So what would you be thinking other than you're going to just somebody give him a shove right there? You know, but what, what would you be thinking about that in that moment? You'd be thinking, you know, this is, a, this is a trauma in our spiritual journey. Well, what if the laws do get changed and, and your faith no longer matters? What if the laws do get changed and, and, uh, and all charitable giving receipts are pulled and, you, and there is no more of that? 
What, 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 you know, what will happen if, <clears throat> if you're no longer allowed to assemble together as a, as, a, as a church, as a body? What then? These are things in our world today. These are very real conversations. What happens if somebody comes by and they say, you know, you're offending me because of your faith and I'm going to sue you and I'm going to sue your church because of that. And you know that that Regent University was just sued for that and they lost at the Supreme Court. Ananias is in this situation. Saul is on his way to his town. He's going to arrest Ananias if he finds him. And all of a sudden, there, and, and Ananias maybe heard rumors that F Saul fell off his horse and he's recovering in, in the house of Judas. Boy, there's a, you know, Judas. It's, you know, Judas, the guy who betrayed Jesus. That's a great name for Saul to be recovering in, right? And so now he's being called to Judas's house. But, but as he's praying, God says to him, in the midst of the storm of faith around him, God says to him, Ananias, I need you to get up and to go down to where this, this, this political representative is who has all of these, these writs and all of these papers and all of these legal documents. And, and you know what? Yes, and maybe there's soldiers with him. Ananias, I want you to go down, knock on the door, go in and say, say I'm Ananias sent from God to pray for Paul. Okay, then. Well, that's a storm. So what happened? Ananias says, Lord, if that's really you, ask me to get out of the boat and come walk to you. Because I'll be ready. Now, taking a life preserver with me today, there's going to be no weapons. Well, nothing right here. No way to protect myself. <laughs> if that's you talking to me on the stormy seas of life, I'm ready. Damn. I can picture him because I have a vivid imagination. He gets up from his knees. His wife might say to him, what are, you, what are you doing today, dear? Well, dear, the Lord has spoken to me. I'm going to see the accuser of our brethren. And I'm going to pray for him today. And she's thinking, do we have life insurance? <laughs> she's thinking, you know, she's thinking, you know, wait a minute now, we better pray about this together. There's no God has called to me from the storm. Closes the door behind him, begins to walk out. And you know what it's like when you think this is your last walk down this path? You're paying close attention to everything now. And your stomach is feeling sick, and your hands are all sweaty, your mouth has gone dry, and you're getting closer and closer. And everybody around you knows that you're a Christian because God just doesn't choose any random individual but those who have been found righteous in his sight, like Abraham or Ananias. You're walking down the street. People are saying hi, you're saying hi back. And maybe you're thinking to yourself, will this be my last time down the street? Doesn't matter, because I plan to go into the lion's den because the Lord has asked me so. And he's able to deliver me. But if he should choose not, I want you to know this. If he asks me to get out of the boat, I'm getting out of the boat. See, and he, down he goes. And he gets in, and it, it's, it's interesting because it says it's, the name of the street is Straight Street. So I suspect it's straight. It's not Crooked Street, it's Straight Street. And he can see the house in the distance because it's a straight line, right, to Jesus' <laughs> house. Turns the corner, goes on to Straight Street, and there it is, and he's walking straight down to down to Judas's house, and he knows which one it is. Stands there for a minute, takes a deep breath, says a quick little prayer. Lord, this is it. No turning back now. But I'm ready. I'm ready. Knocks on the door. Doesn't know what to expect. But when he goes in there, 
he finds something that absolutely amazes him. God was right. He walked on the water. He put his hands on Saul. And he said, it, look, look at what he said. Did you see what he said there? He said, uh, where did it go? Because it, it was a really cool thing. He said, uh, he said, Brother Saul, placing his hands on Saul, he said, verse 17, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Isn't that cool? Brother Saul, the Lord who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here to kill me. That's why he was going there. The Lord who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here to destroy my church. The Lord who appeared to you on the road before I even knew what was going on. We were in a prayer meeting praying on Wednesday night that something bad would happen to you and this thing would be stopped. But as the Lord appeared to you on the Damascus road, he sent me to you so that you would receive your sight. He did. You read about it. It says the scales fell. Something like scales fell off. You see, Ananias understood about the bread. Do you get that? What did, well, what did he understand? What he understood was this. Your talents, your silver, your gold, these things don't matter. What matters to God is, is your obedience to bring what you have. What do I have? I have a testimony. I have an experience with God. Lord, you did something. It's not my experience, it's not Brad's experience, it's Brad's experience, it's not my experience. But what my experience with God is, is what I have to offer to God. And he breaks it up into bite-sized pieces. And then he gives it back to me and he says, okay, I need you to distribute this to the souls of the world and to the, all the sheep that are wandering around and to, the people who are hungry. It's broken up down to bites. You don't give them the whole story. No one's going to believe that story. Give them this piece that applies just for where they're at today. Once I was lost, now I've been found. Once I was crippled, now I can walk. Once I was blind, now I can see. See, those are the bite-sized pieces of the story. So I'm going to ask you this. <clears throat> Who have you prayed with this week? Who have you prayed with this week? We can preach to people pretty good. <clears throat> but who have you prayed with? this week? Who have you shared your life with in the bite-sized pieces this week? Well, you say, well, you know what? I, I'm not so good at that. But you know what? You know what I decided? <clears throat> and, you know, people say this. They say, you know what? I'm not Brad Zilger. I said, I'm not Mark Collins. I'm not William Walter Davis. I'm not Jody Getson. I'm not Paula. I'm not, you know, we list the list of who we're not. But I, you know what the Lord said to me this morning? I was coming back from something and, and the Lord said this. He said, he said don't Compare yourself to other people who they are today. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday. Get that? Compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who someone else is today. And who was I yesterday? I might have been stumbling a little bit. Maybe, maybe yesterday I prayed for 30 minutes. Today I prayed for 31. I'm getting there. One minute at a time. <clears throat> Maybe yesterday I, I, I wasn't so sure well, who I was spiritually, but today today God spoke to me. Today I'm a different person than I was yesterday. Just a little bit. You know something else the Lord said to me this morning? I, I was... Uh, <laughs> and I asked about you all, so this is not just about me, because this was I asked about you all too. I said, he said, uh, 
He said, I created you. And I know what you're capable of. And you're capable of a whole lot more than you think you are. That's what he said about you. You are capable of a whole lot more than you think you are. Come on. Follow me on the boat, he says. And I will make you something that will blow your mind. Something you can't be by yourself. Well, that's all I'm going to say about that. You know, I, I really believe in you guys. <clears throat> I believe in you all. No, no, nobody here I don't believe in. I believe that God has great plans for you. So don't settle for such small crumbs when he wants to feed the thousands through your life. 